There is. No, the Bible talks about quarantine for the sick. I know that. Yeah, it does. Not the healthy. I forget what was it, seven days? Quarantine? I don't remember. I read that here a while back. Quarantine for certain things. For the sick, which makes sense. Yeah, it does. So it's not a new term. <laughs> it's a misapplication. They have, yeah. Well, I feel bad. Like my two sons, they really love the Lord, but uh, I don't think they really uh, come to the place where they really believe every word like that. I believe Psalm 91. January 6th? I know. January 6th? Did I mess up? Well, we're supposed to remember January 6th. <laughs> but that's what the date is. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, it's on the... Yes, it's January 6th. I know, it's the on... Second. January 3rd. It's the third today. It's the third today. Oh, third. Well, the second. I know, it's supposed to remember. I just used the template on that. Okay. Well, you can get a hold of us. Yeah. 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 Has he got that thing going already? What thing going? Yeah, I do. Oh, I better be perfect. Oh, yeah. All right, welcome everybody. We have a nice service plan today. We're going to start up with a bang here, and we have communion today, and we have a nice message we're going to be talking about. The blood makes a difference. We're going to be thinking about justification today. And today, right now, we're going to start with a song called Dance Up With My Father God. So we're going to stand together, everyone, and let's start.
Father God, right now we're going to do a song called Come. Now is the time to worship. And it goes like this. God is good all the time. Here we go.
the Father's love. Hebrews 9, 18 through 22. Wherever upon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9, 18 through 22. Praise the Lord. That's what our sermon is about today. Can we have our usher come forward today? We're going to sing one right now, a hymn called, I Surrender All. Here we go.
Well, right now it is time for a film clip that we have as we get ready to switch over the message. Here is one that we're going to do called The Justification. It's in Romans. It was like this. God is perfect, completely holy, and also just. Anything that falls short of his perfection, his righteousness, is sin. His judgment is so precise that to be guilty of breaking even one of his commandments is to be guilty of breaking all. Nothing we can offer by way of gifts or good behavior can fix what sin has broken. We are altogether hopeless. But we will soon see that God is as merciful as he is just, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Apostle Paul uses the word justification to describe this amazing and complete forgiveness of sin. But it came with a great price. The religious leaders could not find any crime against Jesus. Even so, they bound him and delivered him over to be killed. And the mob, filled with the hatred of their own rebellion, demanded he be crucified. The perfect Messiah stood mocked, blasphemed, spit upon, beaten, and falsely accused. Yet he stood quietly, prepared to give his life for the very people who despised him. As he hung between two thieves, the people continued to abuse and cast insults. Save yourself, they cried. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. But even with all the pain and abuse thrown at him, the worst rejection would not be from these enemies of God. It would come from being forsaken by his own father, who could not look on the sins that he was about to bear. Please forgive them, Jesus prayed, for they know not what they do. The offer and plea of forgiveness reached the ears of the two criminals. For one criminal, the offer fueled even more resentment and hatred. But for the other, it sparked a desire for peace and forgiveness. Do you not fear God? The remorseful criminal rebuked the first. We are both condemned and about to suffer what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he turned to Jesus the sorrow of his own sin moving him to repentance. Please, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In that moment, the cries of the angry mob seemed to fade between the broken man and his savior, and mercy was freely given. In the sight of God, he would be justified. God would not see his sin, but would instead see the righteousness of Jesus made possible by his great sacrifice. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus died so that we could live. He faced God's anger against sin so that we could once again be children of God. And he paid the necessary price so that we could be set free from the slavery of sin and death. By faith in Jesus, we are eternally justified, no longer enemies of God, but instead, His precious children. Talking about justification today. Today, we're going to be thinking about the blood makes a difference. We're going to be in be, be back and forth between Hebrews 11 and Genesis 4. And you'd be kind of ready, we're going to go to both of those places. You know, the blood is the life in the human body. And the heart is the source of its flow. And then sometimes when your heart is not working correctly, it can be a very serious problem. It makes me think of a story about a guy who said, I went to the doctor because I had severe chest pains that wasn't going away. I freaked out when I couldn't figure out what it was. And he ended up referring me, he ended up referring me to a cardiologist. Well, the cardiologist ran some labs and some tests and told me to wait for the results in his office. Well, I was pretty relieved when the doctor came back in with the results with a huge smile on his face. I told him, I'm going to be all right, aren't I? Right? And he replied, well, you actually have a severe cor cor coronary, <laughs> coronary, excuse me, uh, coronary artery disease. 
and you're going to need a heart transplant that's going to cost you over a million dollars. I was shocked and flustered. So I said, well, what were you smiling when you came in about? He goes, I'm about to be rich. <laughs> One of those, anyway. Well, let's go to God in prayer. We have a few prayer requests that we're going to hold up. Here we go. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for all, everyone that's here, Lord, and I thank you for this church. There's so much to be thankful for, Lord. But we do have some that we want to hold up. It seems like Danny is sick today, too, and Twyla's not feeling good either, and Darlene is sick today, and Ezra's got car trouble, and everybody's got something, Lord. It seems like um, a lot of people have the fear. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just work a miracle in all the people. And, uh, and I pray that you would just bless this church and help people know the importance of going and, and things, Lord. So we just hold it up to you. I pray that you would heal everybody, but I pray that you would encourage everybody to know the importance of hearing the word and being having fellowship with other people, Lord. We just thank you for this opportunity to serve. I thank you for the message that you've given. I pray that you open up their hearts and eyes and minds, that they would receive this message, Lord, and I thank you again for the opportunity to serve you. We love you, Lord, and I thank you again for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, our central theme is in Hebrews 11 is that God is to be worshipped, and that God is to be worshipped, he has to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And we're going to start right there by reading Hebrews 11, verse 4. Here we go. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet he speaketh. You know, one of the most interesting stories I'd ever heard was from a pastor and stuff that told us a story about this man that was in his congregation, and this man's name was Charlie Fisher. Uh, he was no bigger than a minute, but he's just a little guy, but he weighed two tons spiritually. He was a man who was fearless for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Uncle Charlie was the kind of guy, he had this old airplane, and he had canvas sides, and he had written across the sides of this airplane, Christ is the answer. And he had an open cockpit, and he had, had to get his goggles on and everything. When he flew around, he had a basket full of tracks, and he would fly over the county fairs and dump out tracks over all the people. Then he'd circle around the field with a sign up there that says, Christ is the answer. Now, old Charlie was a real prayer warrior. This preacher that uh, told this story that, that I listened to, and said he prayed with that man, he said, many, many times, and he was just an incredible individual. He had a son named Lee, but Uncle Charlie, finally he died. And Lee was told certain instructions for Charlie's funeral. Now, Charlie told his son, don't worry about my funeral, just invite all my friends and take this tape recorder and push the button, and all you have to do, because Charlie said, I've already taken care of everything. So the funeral finally came, and Charlie was there in the casket, and all the friends were there, and Lee got up, and they pushed the button, and it was Charlie. And he said, hello, everybody. He said, this is Charlie Fisher, and I'm up here in heaven. And he said, it's wonderful up here in heaven. He said he began to tell everybody how glorious it was up there, and he preached a whole sermon on how wonderful heaven is. And he said, I want to tell all of you to come and meet me here in heaven. Well, he was the only guy I ever heard of that preached his own funeral, but Charlie did it. And so Charlie Fisher preached his own funeral, and ultimately he being dead was yet still speaking. Well, there's another man that preached his own funeral that we just mentioned, this man named Abel. And we're going to learn about him today. Now what we see in Abel is a shadow of the crucifixion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On your outline today, first thing, the Old Testament is a book of shadows that point to the New Testament truths. The Bible says, for example, in Colossians 2, verse 17, it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the Bible tells us in the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come, and let's think about shadows for a minute. A shadow must have light, and it must be something to shine upon to make that shadow. On your outline, the light 
is the Old Testament scripture. And the body that the light shines upon, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the angle of the light determines the sharpness of the shadow. For example, in the early morning, the shadows are not real clear, and they're somewhat distorted. But by mid-morning, the shadows become clearer. And then finally, by high noon, there are no shadows at all. In the Old Testament, we have shadows that pointed at the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Calvary came in the New Testament, on your outline, then it was high noon. There were no more shadows. And what you're going to see here with Abel is, on your outline, the beginning of these shadows that are pointing to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you would look with me again in Hebrews 11, 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered a, to God a more excellent sacrifice. And so where is this story now? Well, it's found in Genesis 4. Because, listen, you are not going to understand Hebrews 11 unless we understand Genesis 4. Now, we see here that Adam and Eve, they conceived. And here is Adam and Eve, the first human beings on earth, and she conceived to bear Cain. So Cain was her firstborn. She thought Cain was going to be the Savior. Of course, Cain didn't turn out to be the Savior at all. And she says, I've gotten a man from the Lord. But then she again bear his brother, Abel. Well, Abel was the one that we're talking about today, and he was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So there is one, a shepherd, and there's one that's a farmer. One's a shepherd and one's a farmer. And it says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground as an offering to the Lord. It's his own idea. But Abel brought forth the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Now the Lord had respect upon Abel in his offering, but unto Cain he had no respect. And Cain was wroth about it. His countenance fell. And we're going to stop reading right there. And I want you to keep your Bibles marked right there with Hebrews 11 and Genesis 4. And we're going to go back and forth and we're going to understand that what we have here is a shadow of the cross in the offering that Abel made. So again, we have two offerings that were made. Cain offered the fruit of the ground, and of course it said, in the process of time. And he offered vegetables to the Lord, but Abel offered unto the Lord a slain lamb of the first fruits, firstlings of the flock. The Bible says that God accepted the offering of Abel, but he did not accept the offering of Cain. So one of the offerings from the fruit of the ground, the other one was from the spotless lamb. We're going to see here in Hebrews 11 and Genesis 4 some contrast. So here we go. Are you ready? First of all, there is a contrast in their worship. So there's two boys. They're worshiping God, and one is worshiping in spirit and truth, the way God wanted, and the other is worshiping with his own ingenuity, isn't he? Now remember, Hebrews 11, 4, by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. What's the difference? Now listen very carefully here. And I want to start by saying all religions are not the same value. I mean, in America today, we're the church is looked upon as being politically un incorrect. I mean, it's looked almost un-American if we don't put our arms around everybody else and say your religion is as good as mine. But it is not true. God had respect unto Abel's offering and Cain's offering. God did not. Now we are supposed to be tolerant today in America, and I believe in tolerance in some areas, but I do not believe in tolerance that sacrifices truth. Now, there is nothing today so intolerant as the intolerance of those against those of us who say there's a fixed standard of right and wrong, where there's a true religion and there's a false religion. Because I'll tell you right now, the world doesn't need religion. I tell you, it already has too much religion. This world needs Jesus. Now, did you know that scholars have reported that there are 9,900 different religions and that almost 10,000 different religions? That's almost 10,000 different religions. Listen to me. There are only two religions in the entire world on your outline. There's the true and the false. Now, that may seem narrow to you, but that's what our lesson is all about today. There is the religion of grace, and there's the religion of works. There's the religion of Cain. And there's the religion of Abel. Now let's look at this. I'm not asking you to take my word for it, but let's look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about it because I realize that what I'm preaching today is politically incorrect. But so be it. That's what we do. We preach God's word. Let's look at the worship of Cain. Hebrews 11:4. It says, By faith, 
Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What was the sacrifice of Cain? Well, on your outline, the way of Cain was the way of good works. It was salvation by his own effort. Now, he was the tiller of the ground. The Bible says, you're going to till the ground by the sweat of your brow. And what Cain offered to God was by his own toil. It was by his own sweat. It was by his own effort. When he came with his offering of vegetables and fruit, he tried to substitute it for God's plan. Now, it may have been beautiful. He may have tried in his own way, maybe way harder than Abel. But he couldn't even look like a country fair there. I mean, you can almost picture it there, the fragrant flowers and the beautiful fruit and the most succulent vegetables. And he's offering this to God because he's out there plowing the ground and he's working it. And the Bible says, cursed is the ground. And of the sweat of your brow you till the ground. And what he has done is that he has offered his own good works, trying to substitute it for God's way. I want to read something to you, and it says in Jude, <coughs> Jude 11, it says this. And I'm going to explain this and take a few footnotes here and kind of get off track just a little bit because of this verse. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. I'm going to break that down and show it to you real quick, and then we're going to go back to the way of Cain. But the way of Cain is salvation by works. The error of Balaam is covetousness, getting richer for doing God's work. He got paid to go curse Israel. And the other doctrine of Balaam, which is in Revelation, is he caused the righteous to stumble. And then we have the gainsaying of Korah. Gainsaying means against the word. And the gainsaying of Korah was not following the will of God. He was thinking that he was righteous and he wanted to go and he wasn't ordained and he wanted to do some of the priest's activities. And of course he was killed. But again, we see that what is the way of Cain? It is to try to save yourself by doing your own good works rather than by the grace of God. Trying to come to God your own way rather than God's way. And so listen, on your outline, good works represents culture rather than Calvary. In Hebrews 9.22 it says, without the shedding of blood there is no remission or forgiveness. So there is no salvation on your outline apart from the shedding of blood. And what did Cain offer? Vegetables. You can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission. But again, without the shedding of blood there is no remission at all. And you say, well that's only what I say. But no. That is what God says. You say, well, I have my own religion. I don't believe yours. Well, so did Cain. And you say, well, I'm looking for a religion that suits me. So did Cain. So did Balaam. So did Korah. But Cain died and went to hell. And so did Balaam. And so did Korah. And Hebrews says, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And it is not salvation. It is not salvation by works. Here, Cain offered the fruit of the ground, which is the same thing. But what did Abel offer? Genesis 4, 4, Abel offered the firstlings of the flock. Abel's offering was based on a blood atonement. It wasn't the harder way, but it was the right way. And again, the only worship that God accepts is the worship that God directs. Now, let me tell you the difference between these two. Now, I said there is a difference between religion and Jesus Christ. And here is the difference. Religion is what sinful people try to do for a holy God. And the gospel is, on your outline, what a holy God has already done for sinful man. So we can rest in Him and what He's done. It's about grace. In Hebrews 11.4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Now, where did Abel get that idea of the bringing of the blood offering to Almighty God? Because they hadn't even started eating meat yet. Now, remember, this is just a shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where did he get this idea? Well, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves and stuff. What was that? That was the fruit of the ground. What did God do for them? When God came into the Garden of Eden and God made them coats of skin, animal skin, for clothing. How did he get those coats of skin? Blood had to be shed. 
And we're to be able to learn that it took blood. And now without the, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Well, he learned it from his parents. And you say, well, did he really know this? I want to tell you something right now. Abel, on your outline, was a prophet of God. A prophet. Where do you get that? Well, it says so in Luke. Luke 11, 49 through 51. <clears throat> Listen to this. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So he calls Abel a prophet, he calls Zacharias a prophet, and of course it's not really in the Bible, but it's in Josephus, where when Herod sent out his people to go after Jesus down in Bethlehem, and they were, the wise men told them to go to Egypt, they went down there and they didn't find Jesus, and they went right back to John the Baptist, and uh, they went after the mother and John, and they ran away, and they chased after them, and somehow, through Josephus, it says, they went to a mountain, and the mountain opened up, and they took them inside, and they weren't able to get John the Baptist and his mother, and so they went back to Zacharias, and they tried to get Zacharias to help them do stuff, and Zacharias wouldn't, and so they killed him and stabbed him right between the altar and the temple, and that is a story about that. But what we're talking about is that all of the prophets, I mean all of the prophets, including Abel, we're talking about Abel is called also a prophet of God. And on your outline, Abel was a martyr that died for his faith. So Adam and Eve had two sons. One was a martyr and one was a murderer. Abel was a prophet and he understood the word of God. And you say, well, did he really understand about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, listen, since he was a prophet, we have to remember that prophets hear from God. Look what it says in Acts 10.43. It says this, Acts 10.43. To him give all the prophets witness. Give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions of sin. So Jesus gave all of the prophets on your outline witness. That means if Abel was a prophet, he was, see, he is, he, we know that the Bible says that he gave all the prophets witness, means that they understood the plan of salvation because remember, prophets hear from God. Priests are hear from the people and they go to God to tell him, prophets hear from God. So if any prophet pretty much has God's gospel story in their heart because they're hearing from God, and once they know that gospel story, and they are a prophet of God, working for God, they are righteous. They're considered righteous. And back there in the Garden of Eden, just outside the Garden of Eden, there was a man named Abel who offered a spotless lamb. And that is a picture of a prophecy of the Jesus who is to come. Isn't the Bible wonderful? I mean, it's just all connected together so wonderfully. It is so awesome. We don't want to get the idea that people were all back there just plowing with sticks and didn't know anything at all. <laughs> Let me say something else. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was an afterthought. Was not, excuse me, was not an afterthought. It was not an emergency action or anything. God had the redemption of blood in his heart before he even made the world. We see that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, when it says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, here what we see, slain from the foundation of the world, before he swung this world into space, he even knew the unsaved who wasn't going to be saved. And God had the redemption of blood in his mind before that time, before he swung it all out into outer space. And you can prove that. You just take the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you can cut it anywhere on your outline and it will bleed. There's a red river of life and it begins to flow from the book of Genesis. It goes all the way to the book of Revelation to the chapter that just read you. The river began to flow when God made coats of skin for Adam and Eve. And then the river passed on down when Abel took the first things of the flock and offered the blood sacrifice unto the Lord. And then we come to Noah. And the first act that Noah did when he came out of the ark after Genesis 6, after the flood came, was on your outline to offer a blood sacrifice. 
And then we see God called Abraham, and Abraham, the father of the faithful, and God said, take your son up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And at that last moment when the knife was just about to go into the bosom of Isaac, God said, Abraham, don't hurt the lad. Look over there, there's a ram that's caught in a thicket. And we've talked about that ram before, and it was a ram that was crowned with thorns, and his horns were locked in the thicket. And with his horns locked in the thicket, God says, take that ram and sacrifice him. And so it's no wonder that Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And we see Abraham way back. And I mean, more than a millennium before Jesus came, he knew something about that blood sacrifice. But then, after that, God called Moses. And God said, Moses, take my people from the land of Egypt and the land of sin and darkness and slavery and bring them out into the promised land. And God said, and now Moses, when you do this in order to let the people go, tell every family to take a lamb and sacrifice that lamb and put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of the house because my death angel is going to come to the land of Egypt. God says my death angel is going to be looking for something. He's going to be looking for the blood to see if that blood is there put up on the doorpost. Apply my way. Now listen, God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And that's where we get the word Passover. But at Passover, friends, it was, on your outline, the blood that caused the death angel to pass over. Now I tell you, if they would put rub diamonds and rubies there on the door, the death angel would have come. If they would have taken and put beautiful poetry on the door, the death angel would have come. If they would have taken a live, spotless lamb, set that live, spotless lamb there, the death angel would have come also because it's all about the shed blood put upon those doorposts. God's way. You know, people say, Christ is my example, but you know something? That's just not enough. Listen, he has to be more than that. He has to be your Savior. You need his cleansing blood because you are not saved, on your outline, by learning lessons from the life of Christ, but by receiving life from the death of Christ and his resurrection. And again, God says, when I see what that I'll pass over. What will he see? The blood. And I tell you, just like he did at Passover, and the death angel will pass over you if you're under the blood. Now, after Moses got them into the land, God gave them the Levitical law, and they were told how to make these sacrifices. And every smoking altar of every Jewish temple from that time on that was sacrificed all points to the coming of Jesus Christ. Thousands and thousands of lambs and rams and turtle doves are offered and blood is shed. But why is this? I thought the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That atonement was only temporary. And remember, atonement is not propitiation, which means satisfied or completely taken away. So why did people have to sacrifice all these animals then? I mean, why all those sacrifices? Here's why. Because God is just pointing toward Calvary, where the red river of life begins to run. And I tell you, all these are just shadows. These are all prophecies. They're all types. They're all lessons. And these are all just the lessons where it shows the river runs and runs and runs and runs until it finally comes to Calvary. And it stops there. And it reminds us how serious sin is. And when Jesus bows his head and dies with his precious redemption blood and his is shed, this is what God is getting the people ready for in the Old Testament. It's like this. There's a man by the name of Pavlov, and he's a Russian psychologist. And he did experiments in what we could call conditioned response. He got his dogs, and he would ring a bell and then feed the dogs. He would ring a bell and then feed the dogs. And he kept doing that. He'd ring a bell and feed the dogs. And pretty soon, all he'd have to do is ring the bell and the dogs began to drool. They began to salivate because they knew the bell meant food. That's exactly what God is doing in the Old Testament with these sacrifices, beginning with the skins that he clothed Adam with, and also then, you know, beginning with Abel's offering. And I mean, what God is doing with all of this, listen, he's conditioning his people, and there is a conditioned response that when we see the blood, listen, we know on your outline, sin means death. Sin means death. Shed blood requires death. Sin means death. God reassured uh, uh, 
God required a partial substitute with the atonement, and therefore people were ready for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which would be the final one. And when he died upon the cross, and many knew what it was all about, without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission. And he became the ultimate sacrifice. So don't think that it was incidental, because this is truly fundamental. But ultimately, there is a contrast in their worship. Now, second, not only was there a contrast in their worship, but notice next on their outline, the conquest of their worship. The consequences, excuse me, the con consequences of his worship. Excuse me. Let's look at Genesis and see the consequences here. Genesis 4, 5, and 6. Let's read it. <clears throat> but unto Cain and his offering he had no respect, not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? So Cain is angry, and God is asking him why. And we know God did not have any respect for Cain and all of his good intentions and his good works because God wants it done the way God wants it done. So listen, the difference between Cain and Abel is the difference under outline between righteousness and unrighteousness. You see, righteousness under outline is being right with God, following his orders, doing it like him. It's not the harder way or the easier way, it's the right way. And you would think that God would just say to Cain, well, you tried, you meant well, you could have got, you should have got a 100% grade on your test. I'm going to grade on the curve. And so, you know, no, God doesn't grade on the curve ever. God has a certain set of standards. He doesn't just get an A for effort. God will not overlook sin because he is perfect. God is very clear about the right way. And remember that big, plain, and straight on your outline, God will not overlook sin. And we've heard people say, well, God is too good to punish sin, but that's backwards because God is too good to not punish sin. I mean, if you had to go through all the lectionaries or dictionaries of the world and get a world word that would describe God and put it all into one word, of course, that would be impossible. But if you had to choose one word above all words to describe God, it would have to be the word on your outline, holy, not love, <clears throat> because holy means that God never has, never can, never will overlook sin. However, love is one of God's great attributes, but all sin must be punished because God is holy. You see, if God overlooked sin, God would topple from a throne of holiness. God would cease to be a righteous God. It says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and came short of the glory of God. Now listen, do you know what the definition of sin is? And it's what we've already read on your outline. Coming short of the glory of God, a holy God. Now I've already said, don't lay yourself down in the gutter along some hypocrite sin longer than he is. Pride measures himself with man, but not with Jesus. So don't measure yourself that way. I mean, look here, the glory of God and here is you. There's a gap between the glory of God and you, and the answer is on your outline, it's sin. That's the gap between the glory of God and you. You see, we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God, all of us. And measuring yourself with Jesus brings humility, and that is needed for a relationship in Christ. Look what it says in Romans 3, 24 and 25. It says this, Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. So it says propitiation. Now, of course, on your outline, propitiation means satisfaction. That's eternal atonement. And so we see nothing can satisfy our righteousness of God or the holiness of God except the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God cannot and God never has and God never will let any sin go unpunished. Your sin will be either pardoned in Christ or punished in hell and it will never ever be overlooked. I have frequently said that a guilty man is acquitted, the judge is condemned. And if God were to let sin go unpunished, he himself would become a sinner. We're so thankful for Jesus' blood propitiation. 
Listen, all of Christianity is described in three sentences. I deserve hell. Jesus took my hell. And there was nothing left for me except for his heaven. That's it. That's what it's all about. That's salvation by grace. The consequences of that worship is lasting not only in time now, but for all eternity. And I mean that Abel was killed by Cain, but he didn't cease to exist. Because it says, he being dead, yet he speaks. For the child of God, death is not a period, but a comma, because he still lives on. Now here's the third and final thing. I want you to not only see a contrast in the worship, I not only want you to see the consequences of that worship and stuff, I want you to see the conflict of their worship. Look what it says back in Genesis 4, 7 and 8. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then to thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So sin is at the door, and it's crouching. It's at the door like an animal, crouching at the door. And that's what this means. God says, if you do what I tell you to do, you'll do well. But if you God is no respecter of persons. If you do well, God will be with you. He has no favorites, but we found that he does have intimates. People that desire him and want to be close to him. But sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. You will be sin's desire. And that means sin is ready to devour you when you are not being obedient to God. But it says, you shall rule over him. And that is, if you do right, you can. But you must seek to be obedient and to do right. So we see here that sin breeds sin. Sin opens the door for more sin. Cain talked to Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that Cain ended up rising up and against his brother and slew him. Now I want you to listen very carefully, and here it is on your outline. The first murder was over religion. Also, it was a religious crowd that crucified the Lord Jesus. We see Adam and Eve had two sons. One was a murderer, and the other was a martyr. And why did Cain kill Abel? Because his heart was not right with God. And listen on your outline. No man can be wrong with God and be right with his fellow man. Because they go together. That's why false religion many times, on your outline, is characterized by force. People that have false religions will be fanatically physical about converting. But our faith, on your outline, is characterized by love. Now when you think about what's happening in the world today, you think about the people that are being martyred, murdered in the name of religion, rather. And while Christians are just showing their love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're getting martyred too, but I'll tell you, False faith hates truth. Now we think perhaps Cain was too refined to offer a blood sacrifice possibly, but he was not too refined to go ahead and put a knife in his brother. Look what it says in John 16 verses 1 through 3. It says this, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he is doing God a service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father or me. Now, today we have people killing people for God's service. Listen, does that sound contemporary? It's not. The Muslims kill in the name of Allah. They kill Christians. In fact, I have several Korans, and on page 342, it says, and it tells the Muslims that if you kill infidels, God will have favor with you, word for word, right out of the Koran. And so this is what they're thinking. Now, the people that are more reformed, they say they don't go by all of it, but that book has never been reformed to where they don't have to quote it or use it. It's there, and people do use it. But killing people for God's service, and listen, 
that doesn't, that a contemporary thing, that has been going on for years and it's still going on. And I'll tell you the time will come when whosoever killeth you will think that he is doing God a service. And these things they do to you because they have not known the Father or me, which means Jesus. Look what it says in John 16, 4. It says, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But Jesus is saying there's no fine print in the contract. He's saying, I'm going to tell you ahead of time the bad news, that the time will come when they will kill you and they think that they're doing God a service and they're going to do it in the name of God. And remember, in the Quran, love, the word love is not mentioned once. Now friends, the word on your outline, martyr, and the word witness are the same word in the Greek language. You see, death doesn't make martyrs on their outline. It only reveals them. I mean, what is our faith? What is our true faith? One thing, true faith is never based on forth. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest mistakes that the so-called Christian church made was the Crusades. Now, this wasn't why the other uh, Christians, like the Anti-Baptists and the others that were there and stuff, it was basically by the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church, they tried to spread our faith by force. And God says that the promised land belongs to the Jews and nobody's going to take them over. So he didn't let us win or let the Christians win that battle because Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. And we see that all through the Bible. And you say, well, don't you believe in self-defense and things? Now, I believe in it with all my heart. And I believe that there are times that we do need to go to war. But I believe that it's not to spread the Christian faith. We do not spread the Christian faith with violence or force. We do it with love. You need to change a person against their will. They're of the same opinion still. The difference between a true religion and the false religion. People must accept Christianity by their own free will and not by force. And so salvation of Jesus Christ is through faith based on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We base our faith on a promise, not funny feelings or things that we think or anything, on a promise. And it's an individual decision. It's never coerced, never forced, never. On your outline, Cain, Cain slew Abel, but Cain was the loser, not Abel. Abel won the martyr's crown in heaven. So again, there's two religions in the world, only two, the true and the false. The difference between the two religions is the difference between heaven and hell. You say, well, Pastor, I believe that there's another way to heaven than the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I say, oh, really? You do? That's exactly what Obama said. He said, there's lots of ways to heaven. And same with his preacher, the, the purpose-driven life, Rick Warren, said, there's lots of ways to heaven. Well, that's not true at all. Because if that was really, if there was another way than the shed blood of Jesus Christ, then why did Jesus have to die with all that suffering and pain? The Bible says if righteousness came by the law by being good, then Christ is dead in vain. If a man or woman or boy or girl could be saved any other way, Calvary was a blunder and Jesus is a liar. Well, I don't believe that. Why did God let Jesus Christ die on that cross if there's another way? Muslims say Christ didn't die on the cross. He just lied to everyone to, to one day further Islam. What a, what a thing. But Christians believe Christ died on the cross. And we believe that he did go through all that suffering. And if we did believe that, we wouldn't ask, can we take another way? Why did we let his darling son die in agony and blood if there's another way? And here's why. There's no other way. There's no other way. I guess you could call it bigot, right? There's only one way to heaven, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And I tell you, there's a red river, river of blood that flows all through the Bible. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Okay, I have one more to show you about a preacher, a story about a good man as the world goes and a compassionate man as the world goes. And he had the religion of Cain. Doing what was good works for people and living right and honorable. A lot of preachers with the religion of Cain, they just take out the blood and try to do good works and things that are wonderful for people. 
And the ultimate, this, oh, this, this preacher had the religion of king, and he was from a very liberal denomination. Well, he was in his study one day, and there was a knock on the door, and he opened the door, and there was a little girl there, poorly dressed, and he said, hey, little girl, what can I do for you? And she says, I need you to help me badly. I need help for my mother. You need to help me get my mother in. And he thought, well, maybe his mother, her mother was drunk or something. And the preacher said, well, where is your mother? How do you want to get her in? And she said, she's home and she's dying. And she sent me here to find a preacher to help her get into heaven. So please help my mother get in. And he said, well, yes, sweet, I'll go. go. And so he got his coat and he got his hat and he went to the little girl and he went to this poor section of town. And there was this little tenement, and there was this woman on her deathbed dying, and not even any doctors or no nurses or no one to care for her. And he began to talk with her. And he began to tell her about the Sermon on the Mount. And he talked to her about living right and doing good and the kindness and all of these things and all these high, wonderful platitude ideas. And his was a religion of culture and good works and politically correct. And the religion of Cain, trying to do good and come to God his way. But the woman had a distraught look on her face. And she said, you don't understand. I lived this sinful, wicked life, and now I'm dying. And all you're saying, that sounds very good, but I'm dying. I says, I can't do any of that stuff now. Don't you have a message for a woman like me? And the preacher began to think, and he finally realized that he couldn't get a sinner into heaven. He didn't have a message for her or someone like that. So he left. And then as he was going home, he remembered the story that his mother had told him. And he had gone up before he went to seminar and he got educated and got politically correct. And she told him about a Savior that took their sins and carried them to the cross and in agony and blood died. And now it is finished and paid in full. And he remembered that. And so he went back to the lady. And he told her the old, old story. And when he said himself, he really didn't even believe in himself. But he told her about Jesus, and he told her about the cross, and how his blood was covering her sins. And he told her about grace, and he told her about forgiveness, and he led her in a prayer, and she prayed, and she asked Christ to come into her heart, and she was gloriously saved. Gloriously saved when you know later that liberal preacher stood up at a preacher's meeting, at a testimony meeting, and here's what he said. He said, Sirs, that night that that woman came in, I want to tell you, I came in too. I came into the kingdom of Jesus because I gave my heart to Jesus and I myself got saved. And now I can truly say with all my heart, what can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So there again is two religions, two ways. Cain and Abel, vegetables and a lamb. Works and grace. Will you lay your pride and your good works in the dust and just accept Jesus? Will you just say, just as I am without one plea, that thy blood was shed for me? Oh, Lamb of God, I come to thee. I come, I come to thee. So will you, for your sake and for his sake, will you continue to trust him today? And if you're not certain that you're saved, I want you to pray the prayer again. And in this prayer, you can trust Jesus again today. You know, repeating words won't save you. You have to believe it. Here is your chance. The last thing on your outline, the Bible says that it was by faith that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith on your outline, we have peace with God. And I'll tell you the reason, the real reason is because the blood makes a difference. Let's pray. Dear God, dear God, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. God, God's works cannot save me. My works, my good works, Lord, I, I need you in my life and I trust you, Lord, to come in and take control of my life. I pray that you would guide us and guard us, Lord, and just help me to be the person that you want me to be. I want to be your servant, Lord, and I pray that you would just help me to do just that. And as we focus on communion today, Lord, help us to remember the sacrifice of sacrifices that he has made for us and how the blood atones us, Lord. Help us to think on those things and help us to think about our baptism and things was for the remission of sins, that we would take a look at ourselves and try to make ourselves to be like Jesus. 
and analyze ourselves and ask for and confess our sins, Lord, that he would be faithful to forgive us and put us in his life and have favor with us by like washing our feet and letting us be close to you. Lord, and you don't have favorites, but you do have intimates. For those who draw close to you, you would draw close to them. So we know, Lord, what you're thinking and what you want from us. And so, Lord, I thank you again for this opportunity for communion, this opportunity to serve you and give out your word. And I just thank you for the people that were here. We thank you again, Lord, for everything you're doing in our lives and in this church. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, we have communion right now, and so we're going to pass out the emblems. We could have our ushers come and pass out the emblems, and we're going to sing the Spirit of the Living God. Yeah. Here we go. freely by your grace, Lord, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a substitutionary sacrifice for our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Lord, we're so thankful that you made a way. You are the way. And Lord, we're followers of that way. We just praise you, Lord. And thank you for redeeming us from our sin. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. And Lord, with your 
this bread, it represents your broken body and all the trials that you went through here on earth, the trials that we go through, Lord, that you endured them in human, as a human, and you endured them with only the, the gifts and stuff that we are allowed to use too, Lord, but you endured everything without sin. And so, Lord, you just proved so much, not only your covenant, but everything you did to go through it, and you have shown us that there is a way for us. You continue, Lord, with your example, guide us and guard us and help us and encourage us by everything that you've done. So, Lord, as we take these emblems, we'll think on you and we'll think on how we need to be more like you. Let's take our emblems right now. Lord, you've endured so much for us. It's so sad to see the lukewarmness that's in the world and all that you went through and how much suffering and everything and how traumatic it was for so many people to be nonchalant about this. Lord, we, we do seriously thank you. Thank you for letting us have our place that we might identify with you, Lord. You're so awesome. You love us more than we'll ever know. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us for our shortcomings. We definitely fall short of the glory. But Lord, we love you and we need you. And we confess it with our mouth that we need you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, right now, we have one more, sing one more chorus of that song. We pick up the other one.
Yes. I'll try to be a little louder for you, Don. <laughs> uh, it's what, close to five years that we've been you want coming on a regular basis. I think it's been, uh, is this on? It is on. Got, got turned up, Don. I think it's been about five years that we've been coming on a, on a regular basis, and we feel now the Lord's asking us to move along. So we go, having made new friends, and uh, we thank each of you, each of you. We appreciate you, and we wish for you God's continued blessing and direction in your life as individuals and your life as a church. So God bless you, and lead you and guide you in the days ahead. As we look at things, with, we have some questions about what's really going to happen here in our country. But uh, God is in control, yes. and He is worthy of our trust. Yes. So continue on in your faith and your trust in Him. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. You will be sorely missed. You know, I'm glad that we will be missed. We'll be sad if we weren't. Yeah. You know what? Amen. we will be sad if we weren't. Amen. 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 There's not as much to clean these days, it seems like. Oh, yeah, no, no, my part. <laughs> I've got a head on my yeah. part. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Thank you. Shall we get adjusted or something? That's nice. Well, I guess the teachers are waiting. Well, the Lord's going to have to deliver us. Yeah. 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 We may. You didn't get a hook.
it's just colds. It seems like the, the symptoms that they have, they don't even didn't lose their taste. They only could got plugged up nose and couldn't smell very good. And in about a day or two, it's it's gone. And then the virus is good for two or three weeks, just like a cold. You know, if you have a cold for three or four a week, have it, and then you're good for a month, and then you can get that cold again because your immune system, you know, doesn't have those protective things in there. That's just how this is out there. I read in 2020. Mm -hmm. I mean, 21. The doctors cannot say there's any flu. It's all going to be COVID. It's all going to be COVID, yeah. We haven't had any flu deaths anymore, you know. So. Well, do you know why? Because it's COVID. It's COVID, yeah. There's it's 700 kinds of COVID. The COVID virus is all up. The flu is snapping. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when they first started testing for COVID, they said it was hard to tell the difference from it in a cold. Well, no, besides that, it's 